Lord, you alone are worthy. You are the Holy One of Israel. And Lord, we come and bring you our worship and our praise. And we thank you, Lord, that you give us your Ruach HaKodesh and that you enable us also to be worthy in you and to be holy in you. So Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time. Pray that you open up the scriptures to us as we study it. B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Well, thank you so much to uh, the worship team uh, for leading us. I hope you joined in in worship with us today. And so uh, this morning, I'm going to be continuing the series that I've started making our case for Yeshua, the Messiah. And uh, we are now, I think, in the sixth message of the series. And we are looking at the reasons why we believe that Yeshua is the promised Messiah of Israel. And we have been looking at Messianic prophecies up to now. Very soon we'll have some testimonies. And we're also trying to answer Jewish objections to faith in Yeshua as the Messiah. Throughout the pages of the Tanakh, the Hebrew Scriptures, there are these predictions or these prophecies about the coming of a Savior, the Promised One. And He is the one who will come and reverse the effects of the fall and that He'll fulfill God's program of redemption for Israel and the nations. These Messianic prophecies are identifying credentials, if you like, of the Messiah. So we can tell the real Messiah apart from all the Messiah wannabes in history and still today, of course. And as Messianic Jews, we have no doubt that Yeshua is our promised Messiah and that He fulfills all that Moses and the prophets wrote about. And so our testimony is the same as those early disciples of Yeshua, who are all Jewish themselves. And uh, we have this reading where we have Philip, who found his friend Nathaniel to tell him about the Messiah. Wouldn't you want to tell your friends about the Messiah if you have found him? And this is what he did. He says, Philip found Nathaniel and tells him, We found the one that Moses spoke in the Torah and also the prophets wrote about, Yeshua of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And... Yeshua himself, the Messiah, tells us, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. Everything written concerning me in the Torah of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. And so the Messiah must come to fulfill all that is written about him in the Torah, in the prophets, and in the other writings. However, you often come across an objection from various Jewish sources that say the Torah doesn't specifically speak about the Messiah. While it's true that the Messiah is not specifically mentioned, or the title of Messiah is not used in a very special way in the Torah, the concept of the Messiah is throughout the pages of Torah. And we've already seen through our previous studies that there are references in the Torah to a redeemer, to a deliverer, a savior, and a king who would come and restore humanity back to God and reverse the effects of the fall. That is throughout the Torah, but you, know, you need to know what you're looking for. We've already shown that from the Torah itself, the Messiah would be a seed of woman with a hint that somehow you'll also be God in the flesh. We've seen that the Messiah must be also the seed of Abraham and a king from the tribe of Judah. Today, we're going to look at a prophecy that Moses himself gave in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. Let's read that, 18, verse 15 to 18. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among, from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see his great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command them, command him. And so this prophecy comes in the context of Moses warning the people of Israel not to follow the abominable practices of the pagan nations around them, and that uh, they were not to listen to false prophets, 
diviners, witches, spiritists, and the Israelites were to listen only to the Lord's prophet. Moses tells them that the Lord will give them a prophet like me that will speak words that are true. And furthermore, according to verse 16, and remember this, according to verse 16, this prophet like Moses will also act as a mediator between God and the people, just as Moses did at Mount Sinai, so that the Israelites would not have to look at God face to face directly, which was a terrifying prospect. It's an interesting thing, because often you might hear a Jewish objection that says something like this, we don't need a mediator, we go straight to God and don't need a mediator. Well, that's never been true in our history. Moses certainly was a mediator, and so were the priests that served on behalf of God. Now, there is a contention whether this actually is a messianic prophecy or not. Some say that this prediction is of a future order of prophets, and others understand this to be a progressive prophecy, beginning with the order of prophets and culminating in the final prophet, the Messiah. The famous medieval Jewish philosopher and commentator from the 12th century, Mammonides, believed that Moses was in a league of his own, and that there would never be another prophet like him, according to Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 10. And there has not arisen a prophet since in, his, uh, since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. None like him for all the signs and the wonders that the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land, and for all the mighty power and all the great deeds of terror that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. And so these are actually the final verses of the book of Deuteronomy, and it's believed to have been written by someone else other than Moses, perhaps Joshua or someone else. But rather than interpreting this verse to be saying that by the time of the ending of the book of Deuteronomy, the time of the writing of this verse, that no prophet like Moses had arisen, Mammonides says no one will ever be like him. And other rabbinic commentators have agreed, and that's been the general traditional interpretation ever since. This further is supported by the verse in the Torah when Aaron and Miriam were grumbling against Moses. The Lord said, in Numbers chapter 12, verse 6, And he said to them, Hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth, clearly and not in riddles. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And so this is why Moses is considered as the supreme prophet in Israel to whom all the other prophets look to. And this continues to be the traditional Jewish understanding that Moses is, an, is incomparable and stands alone as God's supreme prophet. And one can see how this has been used effectively as a mechanism against Christianity and Islam, since both Yeshua and Muhammad are claimed by their followers to be prophets like Moses. It may be a good defense against Yeshua, but does this argument actually hold water? What did Jews believe before they had to defend themselves against Christianity and Islam? Well, I'll give you a few reasons why we believe that this prophecy by Moses is in fact a messianic prophecy. Point one, early rabbinic Judaism looked forward to a redeemer like Moses. Early rabbinic Judaism looked forward to a redeemer like Moses. Prior to Judaism's controversy with Christianity and later Islam, the early sages and rabbis believed that this verse was messianic. This can be seen in the concept that appears in the ancient Midrashim. And there's a comment in the Midrashim that says, Like the first Redeemer, so the last Redeemer. Like the first Redeemer, so the last Redeemer. The idea is that the final Messianic Redeemer will be patterned upon the first Redeemer, Moses. And multitudes of patterns are drawn between them 
and the Midrashim. As the first one appeared among them, uh, let me quote to you, as the first one appeared among Israel and then disappeared from among them, so the last Redeemer will appear among Israel and then disappear from among them. In other words, just as Moses had two comings, if you like, remember the first time he, he appeared to his people as a Redeemer, they rejected him, so the Messiah will have a first and second coming. Other early commentaries like Kehilat Rabbah, that's the commentary on the book of Ecclesiastes, the Targums Jonathan, and the Targums for Lamentations and the Song of Solomon, all give parallels between Moses and the expected Messiah, clearly drawn from this prophecy in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. And supposedly the earliest rabbinic reference to this idea is found in Tanchuma, in two places. It says the following, how long will the days of the Messiah last? Rabbi Ikiba said, 40 years. As the Israelites spent 40 years in the wilderness, so he, the Messiah, will lead them forth and take them into the wilderness and cause them to eat bitter herbs and roots. And so here we see uh, how there's very clear dis a connection between the Messianic prophecy of uh, Je uh, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, and the expectations of the early sages. Many more examples could be given, but these should suffice to show that even in rabbinic Judaism, the concept that the Messiah will be like unto Moses is a very pervasive idea. These expectations may not be explicit explicitly linked to Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, but they probably have their origins there. The second point is that the grammar in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15 to 19 points to an individual prophet like Moses. Moses is not speaking about multiple prophets, but he consistently speaks about a singular prophet, a prophet like me, a prophet like me. The nouns, pronouns, and verbs associated with this prophet are all in the grammatical singular form pointing to one prophet that will arise that is like him. Point three is that the prophet is to be a mediator like Moses. In Deuteronomy 18 verse 16, Moses gives the reasons why a prophet like himself will be given to the people of Israel, just as the people needed a singular mediator between God and man at Mount Sinai, and that the mediator was the man Moses, Moses in the future the people will need a singular mediator between God and man, and that individual will be a prophet like Moses. In brackets, the Messiah. Point four, Jews of the second temple period expected the soon coming of a prophet like Moses. The fact that Maimonides interprets Deuteronomy 18 verse 15 uh, as to say that there is no other prophet like Moses ever is incorrect. It can be seen in the fact that the Jews of the second temple period continued to expect the soon coming of a prophet like Moses. Let me give you some background to the period that we're talking about. This is the period between the end of the prophetic tradition of Malachi and the beginning of the New Testament period or the Second Temple period, there was 400 years of silence since the last designated prophet in Israel had spoken, namely Malachi. And this is according to Jewish tradition. Josephus also picks up on this, writing about this first century period. He said, It is true, our history hath been written since Artaxerxes, i.e. the time of Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, very particularly but hath not been esteemed of the like authority with the former by our forefathers, because there hath not been an exact succession of prophets since that time. So Josephus also believed that the prophets had ceased to speak for hundreds of years. This seems to be a universal belief within ancient Judaism, and it carries over into rabbinic Judaism as well. Consequently, by the time of the first century CE, the Jewish people had been without a prophet for almost 400 years. God was not speaking to his people like he had before. There were, 
there were still priests and there were still judges, but no living and active voice of God amongst the Jewish people. So the Jewish people yearned for there to be a redeemer like Moses, but he hadn't come yet. The strict Jewish sect in the Dead Sea area, of course, the Essenes, had a clear expectation that God would raise up a prophet like Moses. In the Dead Sea Scroll, a particular one, 4Q175, the Essenes strung together a series of three passages from the Torah. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 28 to 29, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18 to 19, and Numbers chapter 24, verses 15 to 17. If you read these passages in sequence, you may see why this is important. Directly after quoting the prophecy about the prophet like Moses, the passage that we've been discussing in chapter 18, the sins placed a text that is almost universally agreed to be messianic. That's the text from Numbers chapter 24, verse 15, which is about a star that will be born uh, in Jacob. The Messiah would come. This leads the readers to expect that the prophet, like Moses, will be, in fact, the Messiah. To put it in, in another way, if someone is doing the things like Moses, then he must be the Messiah. Also, the Jews of Yeshua's day were expecting a great prophet to arrive, either as the Messiah himself or as the Messiah's forerunner. Some speculated that the prophet, like Moses, would be the prophet Elijah returning back from the dead. Or really, did he die? We're not sure. He was taken up to heaven in a chariot. And so there's always this expectation that Elijah would reappear. Others weren't so sure, but in the following passages from the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, we find evidence of Jewish people in the first century who were expecting the great prophet to arrive. For instance, when Yohanan Hamatbil, that's John the Baptist, was immersing people in the Jordan River and preaching, some priests and Levites came from Jerusalem to ask him, John chapter 1, verse 19, Who are you? He openly admitted and did not deny. He admitted, I am not the Messiah. This is John speaking. What then? Are you Elijah? I am not, said John. Are you the prophet? No, he answered. And so you can see how they were waiting and wondering who was John and in what authority he came. In the Gospels, we see Yeshua performing many miracles throughout the, uh, his life on earth. Many of these miracles could only be done, the rabbis taught, by the Messiah himself. On more than one occasion, he miraculously fed thousands of people with just a few loaves of bread and fish. On one such occasion, after Yeshua had fed 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. The people acknowledged this miracle, and this is what they said. John 6, 14, when the people saw the sign, the miracle that Yeshua had performed, they began to say, this is most certainly the prophet who is to come into the world. The prophet, direct reference to Deuteronomy 18, verse 5, the prophet like Moses, because this miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 took place just before Passover. Just as Moses fed the multitude in the wilderness with manna and quail, or we know that it wasn't Moses, but it was God, so Yeshua miraculously fed the 5,000 in a desolate mountain. The peril is very obvious, and it was noticed by the people. After Yeshua had spoken on another occasion, at the Feast of Sukkot in Jerusalem, he invited the worshippers at the most crucial part of that festival, and he said to them, Come to me, and I will give you mayim chayim, living water. And there was quite a lot of speculation as to who he was. There was division amongst the people in Jerusalem, and this is what we read, John chapter 7, verse 40. When they heard these words, some of the crowd said, this man is, really is the prophet. Others were saying, this is the Messiah. Still others were saying, the Messiah doesn't come from the Galilee, does he? And so you can see how this debate as to the identity of Yeshua has continued for the last 2,000 years. But let's have a look at this. We see here that Josephus, 
the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Brit Hadashah leads us to say that the Jews in the first century were looking for a messianic prophet like Moses to come and bring them redemption just as Moses had done in the Exodus. They were expecting this prophet to come at any moment. When the Apostle Kepha, the Apostle Peter, preached an anointed sermon on the day of Shavuot, the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, he said to his Jewish brethren that they need not wait any longer and that this prophet has come. He said to them in Acts chapter 3, verse 19 to 23, Repent, therefore, and return, so your sins might be blotted out. What an appeal. So times of relief may come from the presence of Adonai and that he might send you Yeshua, the Messiah, appointed for you. That's the second coming. Heaven must receive him until the time of restoration of all things that God spoke about long ago through the mouth of his holy prophets. Moses said, Adonai your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. Hear and obey him in all that he shall say to you. And it shall be that every soul that will not listen to that prophet shall completely, be, uh, shall completely cut off from the people. So what a powerful appeal. Listen to this prophet as the actual prophecy in Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 15 says. We believe that Yeshua is this prophet like Moses. Yes, no other prophet has arisen in Israel since the time of Moses until Yeshua came upon the scene. No other prophet would speak mouth to mouth with God like Moses until the Messiah himself came. The Gospels tell us in John chapter 1 verse 17, for the Torah was given through Moshe. Grace and truth came through Yeshua the Messiah. No one has ever seen God but the only and unique Son who is identical with God and is at the Father's side, he has made him known. I want to finish off with a list of reasons why Yeshua qualifies to be the prophet like Moses in fulfillment of Deuteronomy 18 verse 15. I borrowed this list from One for Israel website where they speak of 21 proofs that Yeshua is the prophet like Moses. I've chosen some of those. First off, he definitely was from among his brothers. And that's a good start. The prophet must be Jewish, which, uh, you know, cuts out a lot of other possible contenders. And Yeshua was Jewish, and his heritage was from the tribe of Judah, as we've previously ascertained. Both were shepherds. Yeshua said, I am the good shepherd, and Moses also tended sheep figuratively and literally. Both fasted for 40 days and nights, Moses while on Mount Sinai and Yeshua in the Judean desert when being tempted by Satan. Both spent time in Egypt as children, as Yeshua had to be hidden there for a while as, the, as a baby to escape Herod. Both were born at a time when evil kings pronounced death to all Jewish baby boys in the area. Pharaoh had commanded all Hebrew baby boys to be drowned at birth, and Herod had issued a command to kill all baby boys under the age of two. Both were miraculously rescued from that threat. Both were, God, both were called by God to lead and to save. Both made prophetic predictions that came true. Both instituted a covenant of blood that brought salvation for many. Moses with the Passover lamb's blood on the doorpost, Yeshua, the Lamb of God, brought in a new covenant in his blood on the beams of the cross. And we're going to celebrate later the Lord's Seder. Also, both were given public stamp of approval with an audible voice from heaven heard by the crowd, Moses at Sinai and Yeshua at his mikvah. Both gave up great riches to lead a humble life of service and poverty. Moses from the palace of the king of Egypt, Yeshua from the heights of heaven, both were noted for their great humility. Both were initially rejected by their fellow Jews when, they foretold the, uh, when the foretold salvation didn't seem like it was going to happen. When Moses first challenged Pharaoh, things got a lot worse for the Israelites, leading to despair and anger in his rejection. Yeshua's 
crucifixion also look like a hopeless defeat. Both salvation situations initially looked like the promises were not going to come true, but they did. Both were willing to sacrifice their own lives for the sake of those they were leading and to pay for the sins of the people. Moses did this in Exodus chapter 32. And Yeshua's own readiness to die on behalf of his uh, people is evident in the Garden of Gethsemane. Both miraculously provided people with bread to eat. Manna was sent from heaven for the Israelites, and Yeshua famously fed the multitude twice. Both of their faces shone with the glory of, of heaven, as was noted by the people who saw them. Moses had to wear a veil over his face because it was beaming so much, and Yeshua's disciples also saw the glory of God upon him at the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses chose 12 spies to uh, check out the land of Canaan, and we read that this morning in the Torah portion. Yeshua chooses 12 disciples. Moses appointed 70 elders of Israel, and Yeshua sent out 70 disciples into the world to share the gospel. There's probably a lot others, uh, other kind of similarities that we could look for. And there are amazing parallels between Moses and Yeshua, but there are also differences too. Moses wasn't perfect. After all, he sinned against God, and as a result, he wasn't allowed to enter into the promised land. But Yeshua was indeed perfect. Not only that, God uses, used Moses to redeem the people out of Egypt. Through Yeshua, however, redemption is made possible for every nation, not just one, but every nation, every tribe, and every tongue. Not just, but including the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. And so we have an amazing Messiah. We've seen that he is a king. We've seen that he will be a prophet. But also, we'll look later and see how it tells us in the Psalms, he will also be a priest. And so we read in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26 to 28, For such a Kohen Gadol, a high priest, was fitting for us. Speaking of Yeshua the Messiah, holy, guiltless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need to offer up sacrifices day by day like Moses, so like, uh, like those of other Kohenim Gadolim, first for their own sins and then for the sins of the people. For when he offered up himself, he did this once for all. For the Torah appoints as Kohenim Gadolim men who have weaknesses, but the word of the oath, which came after the Torah, appoints a son who is made perfect forever. And we'll celebrate that in a moment when we have the Lord's Seder. But let's first sing a song and prepare our hearts to participate in what God has provided for us. And so over to Andre to lead us in a song. Let's worship the Lord together. <laughs> 